Well, good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, um, as the case might be. Welcome, and welcome back, if you've been with us before. Uh, my name is Dalibor Petrovich. I'm a partner at Deloitte, uh, and I have a pleasure of hosting the series of live webcasts that we have been delivering primarily to Canadian tech leadership audiences. But of course, we have many friends around the world joining us as well. Um, today's session is going to be something unique and something different. We are going to talk about um, fictional stories. We are going to actually share fictional stories on the potential impacts that generative AI technology could have um, on our future. This session is live. Um, so this means that you're welcome to engage with us. So using the Q&A function of this Zoom platform, please feel free to submit questions or to submit any comments you might have as we go through the session today, which should take us about an hour to finish. Um, so let's maybe move on to the next slide where I'm going to um, highlight what is it that we are actually, what you're going to be enjoying actually today. This particular session is chosen as the main stage, one of the main stage sessions for the forthcoming South by Southwest conference, which will happen March 8th through 16th in Austin, Texas. As for you who, who know, uh, maybe just a, just a gentle reminder that uh, South by Southwest is one of the largest gatherings of uh, professionals who, who, who will discuss uh, technology, culture, and future. And uh, I know that the team that's joining us today, um, headed by Mike Bechtel, our Deloitte chief global futurist, um, have actually presented at South by Southwest uh, this year um, to, to great reviews, and they were invited to come back and take main stage next year. So today's session is our early preview, your preview of what the world is going to experience comes March next year. Um, so I'm really excited to actually hear what the team has prepared. With that, let me just go through a very brief intro and pass the baton over to my guests. So uh, many of you would know uh, Mike Bechtel, who is the Chief Futurist at Deloitte. Mike is joining us uh, from Chicago. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for finding the time to be with us. And Abhijith, who is... Uh, who is a member of, of our next team, uh, our futurist and author, um, who will be taking us through the session today. So with that, Mike, over to you to peel the layer of what dichotomies are. Thank you. Oh boy. No, thank you, Dalibor. It's it's always a pleasure uh, and, and always better together. I, I love um, sharing this this opportunity with you, Dalibor. It's always a treat. And and um, and Abhijith, with, with you as well. You know, folks, for those of you who've who've um, been privy to some of our series on brief history of the future, tech trends, innovation, et cetera, um, you've heard plenty from me, right? For, for those who haven't, you know, with brevity, what's a chief futurist, emerging technology research director, right? Um, but that said, something that our team um, and Abhijith specifically have have recognized over our last five years of studying emerging tech is that it's not enough to just think about it, right? To, to just dash off a white paper chock full of stacks and declare victory. Um, to activate the whole self, you got to feel it too, mm -hmm. right? You got to bring your whole self to the table. And you got to empathize with those who are going to be affected by these emerging techs. And so, and so, you know, Abhijith will explain this better than I, but I'll tell you that dichotomies at its core is a recognition that um, used mindfully, there's a lot that can go right. Used mindlessly, there's a little that could go wrong, maybe more than a little. And so, you know, Abhi, feel free in, in your own authentic words as the leader of this initiative and and, and the originator of this um, this this distinctive program to um, to share your perspectives, my friend. Sure, and uh, thank you all uh, so much for for having us on and and, and featuring dichotomies. Um, this is a 
this is a publication that's near and dear to my heart because uh, in my heart, I'm a fiction writer. That's something that I really care about and practice on my nights and weekends. And I think what I what I would say about dichotomies is and, and the use of fiction is fiction asks a question when we write it and when we read it, it asks what is happening to us. When we apply that question to the future, it asks what could happen to us. And when we apply it in the way that we're doing in dichotomies, what we're doing is saying, what is the positive future that we can bring about with technology used correctly? What is the negative future that could come about if we use it mindlessly, as you said, Mike? And we think about how do we bring about that positive while avoiding the negatives and you know, be clear about what we want to see in the future. Um, in this particular issue, what we're talking about today, we took a look at everybody's favorite hype technology, generative AI. <laughs> And uh, you know, we took a look at it specifically across you know three domains. We looked at workplace, we looked at education and society, and y'all are going to get a taste of each of those today. And we hope that it helps you sort of better imagine the future by putting yourselves in the shoes of the future to understand the implications, the ethics, the risks, and all of the great positives as well. And none of this would have been possible without my two co-leaders on dichotomies, uh, Nathan Bergen and Angela Huang, who are going to be helping us out with the presentation today as well. So just a quick shout out to them for, for all their work. Yeah. Here, 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 here. Thanks, Angela, Nathan, and, and Abby for sure. So gang, before we jump into, into our stories, into our speculative fiction, uh, a little bit of a baseliner. Right, you know, trying to <laughs> explaining generative AI to uh, a couple hundred of our closest friends in in September of twenty three uh, might feel like a like a fool's errand, but I'm not here to uh, tell you stuff you know or to plumb the depths of the stuff you might not yet know. Rather, it, it's to acknowledge that for the purposes of the stories we're going to be sharing and discussing today, we're really talking about the evolutionary notion that machines have graduated from the ability to discern and make decisions, right? Give it data, get a decision, right? To run that math the other way, right? To say, hey, given a decision, typically articulated as a prompt, typically in, indicated in, you know, your language of, your human language of choice, right? Give me some data, right? I had a, a a friend who who you know this isn't technically perfect, but goodness, it makes the point. He said, you know, every time for twenty years we've been doing a captcha to prove that we're human, right? On, on, on a login, right, Dollar You know, you know, like which one of these squares is a bus? And and <laughs> you know, there's inevitably that one where it's like, ah. but in many ways. Humanity's been training, right? Mechanical systems about what a bus is, about what a dove is, about what a Shakespearean essay is, about what a good piece of enterprise Python code is. And so it stands to reason that if you run that crank in reverse, you could say, show me a good, good looking piece of Python code. Show me a good looking bus, right? Write me a marketing campaign. We'll see that in one of our stories. And so at the highest level, right? Leave your distinctions between GANs and LLMs and this vendor, that vendor, this stack, that. Leave that at the door and recognize that what we're really talking about is machines generating content yeah. and how that can go really right or eh, not so right. Dalibor, any ads, edits, deletes on that before we jump into the good stuff? That, that last statement, I think, beautifully summarized it the generative the gen in generative ai is all about generation of new content by the machine and that i think is the breakthrough and that content of course comes in many different modalities or forms from texts reports pictures music um, and i'm keen to now hear these stories so let's delve into that well, folks, without further ado, close your other windows, minimize your distractions, watch our protagonist on the slide or close your eyes, but prepare for RT's story. All right, folks, we're going to start with the positive story, what we know, what we call, refer to in dichotomies as the allure, and then we'll switch over to the 
the concern or the, the negative story afterwards. So here's the allure for the workplace. It's Monday morning. Arthi's car drives itself with ease into a sharp loop off the highway. She drums her fingers incessantly on top of the steering wheel. It's a bad habit she picked up from her father. As the car parks at her office, Arthi's ears perk up to the nostalgic voice of Anderson Cooper, rendered by AI at her request. Her custom news podcast plays a snippet of the latest healthcare scandal that makes her cringe. Arthi strides into her lab and greets the tired faces of her researchers. For the past few weeks, they've been assigned to a drug development project that could ease the symptoms of dementia, and their board wants results as soon as possible. Arthi and her colleague, Roger, study the latest outputs of their proprietary AI, a dozen viable high-fidelity protein structures, replete with percentages to indicate likelihood of side effects. Arthi guides Roger to feed a few structures into their quantum molecule simulator to forecast viability. But suddenly, she receives a call on her tablet from the CEO of their company, Salutech. Ooh. Artie's in trouble, Roger jokes. Oh, be quiet, she replies. A hologram of their CEO, Lars, looking distraught, appears on Artie's tablet. He immediately shares a video with Artie, a press release from the WHO alerting the world to a novel zoonotic virus identified in Zurich. Artie's eyes widen. Listen, Lars, I want to. Lars cuts her off. I know. That's why I called. Shelve the current project and give me five viable vaccine options to move towards clinical testing by the end of the week. Lars cuts the call short. Roger and the other researchers stare at Arthi. Well, let's get started, folks. Arthi gives the word and the lab springs into a frenzy, feeding the WHO's virus sequence into their AI. While the team scrambles, Arthi sits still at her desk, drumming her fingers nervously across the marble surface. More than a decade ago, her father passed away from COVID-19 before a vaccine was available. Even with only one spike protein to address, drug development took an entire year. This newest virus could have hundreds of mutating spikes. Still, with the speed at her fingertips now, she knows her team could help millions of families like hers. Arthi snaps out of her reverie and employs an AI marketing assistant to draft a press release prompting it to talk about her past and her company's desire to create the first vaccine. Remembering the scandal she heard about on her morning podcast, about the marketing issues of a startup named Delivery, Arthi makes sure to send the article to their company's PR manager for review. She also provides permission to generate a video using her face and voice so the company's audience could connect to the emotions of her father's passing. Then she rejoins her team. She's eager to dive into the details. That was the allure. And now we'll switch to talking about the concern in the workplace. It's Monday morning. Only one today. He mutters to himself as he sits down with his morning coffee. Xavier, the marketing lead of AI startup delivery, is trying to cut back after dozens of alerts from his smartwatch about caffeine fueling his anxiety and insomnia. He opens a laptop for his daily download, a report generated each morning with his agenda and relevant news. But before he can begin a leisurely read, he snaps to attention as his AI assistant Kara flashes on screen. He's late to an urgent meeting. How did I miss that? His alarm increases as he reads the article within the meeting invite. The irony of delivery, the AI that failed to deliver. Shocking patient testimonials reveal how the London-based startup perpetuated stereotypes and prejudices towards expectant mothers in the Black community. The technology, which leverages generative AI to create virtual training scenarios for physicians, promised reduced costs, improved bedside manner, and more. Yet. Black mothers claim that physicians trained by delivery have stereotyped them and provided inappropriate dosing for pain management. Says one mother, it's like they've trained their AI on medical thinking from the 2010s. Xavier can't believe the contents of that article. 
Before he can even process, Kara alerts him that the company's founder, Ajay, is calling. Xavier knows better than to make his boss wait. Ajay is yelling at the team as Xavier joins. What do you mean you can't retrain the program? Isn't that what I pay you to do? Maya, the head engineer, hesitates to find the right words for Ajay's temperament. Well, uh, you asked us to use AI as a service to cut costs, and the bias is baked into the vendor's training data. Unfortunately, just it's going to have to take some time. Ajay scoffs. Ugh. Xavier, please be more useful. Use Brand Boost for a marketing campaign and show how inclusive we are, and send it out before lunch. Before Xavier can object, Ajay ends the meeting. Ajay had laid off over half the staff and increased reliance on generative AI vendors, which meant Xavier was the entire marketing department. He rakes his hands through his hair as if to call forth some ideas out of his head. He opens Brand Boost, an AI that builds multimodal marketing campaigns. He rushes to enter various prompts to produce press releases and video ads and uploads them to beat the lunch deadline. As the afternoon passes, Xavier asks Kara, his AI assistant, to assess engagement with the posts he previously distributed. Well, it's not positive, she declares. Xavier's eyes widen at the flurry of comments pointing out the ads only include white mothers and infants, not the black mothers who'd been impacted by delivery. Xavier instructs Kara. Book an urgent meeting with Ajay in the next available time slot. He looks at his coffee mug from this morning wondering how much more caffeine he'll need to get through what he knows will be a horrible evening. And that's our concern. So, you know, what one wonders the appropriate level of contemplative pause required for these two great stories. First of all, let's just celebrate the novelty of what we're doing here. Story time at work, thoughtfully <laughs> purposed, and aimed at building a better tomorrow. Um, I'm goosebumping here because this is really, I, I think, meaningful and pioneering and, and, and team well, well, well written, well read, well rendered. You know, <clears throat> one of the things that jumps out to me and, and Dalibor, I'd, lo I'd love to get your, your gut reaction too. And folks feel free to light up the Q and a uh, too, but there's this, this feeling and I, and I took notes like straight up, you know, reader circle, writer's workshop notes here. That on the Xavier story, that little no notion that that Ajay, the boss, had laid off half the staff <laughs> in, in a cost cutting measure, and that Xavier was the entire marketing department. It it really got me thinking of the perils of you know, can you be too lean, too mean, too clean? And so to me, that was one of the concerns that jumped out right off the bat is sort of this vibe, Dalibor, of me and what army, right? Yeah. Like Xavier yeah. doesn't sound like a complete flake. He just sounds radically outmanned and outgunned. Yeah, yeah. And what jumped at me on both stories is how compressed the timescales here are from the need to action, both cases. Uh, in the first story, uh, drug development, it, it feels like the system is going to pr actually produce options in a matter of days, whereas a decade ago, it took a year. By the way, even that year was spectacularly fast for the times. So what I'm taking away here is that um, Gen I technology is going to truly accelerate action. And the danger is that it will amplify both good actions, but it will also amplify and compress poor actions or bad actions. And that to right. me is a very interesting thing that we have to keep in mind. How powerful I, I, this will be, right? Yeah. Uh, Abhijith is the, you know, as, as the um, ed editor and, and, and storyteller here, it, what, 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 <laughs> how's this for a sophisticated question? What do you think, man? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's absolutely right. The uh, the compression of the time frames, you know, that's one of the reasons we tried to set these stories about five to ten years in the future. You know, let's not think just you know in the tactical view of you know what's the use case tomorrow that we're going to use, but 
five to 10 years from now, when this is really the stuff of, you know, our everyday work lives, like, what is it going to look like? How, how are we going to be able to, you know, use these things to, you know, Im improve our productivity or, you know, make unfortunate uh, mistakes or overconfident mistakes about what, what machines can do without human oversight. Yeah. And, and, and to, to that point of the, 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 this, you know, so, some of the themes that, you know, like a cooking show, some of these takeaways are prepared dishes, right? But that doesn't mean that they're not, not things we, 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 we also believe that, you know, the, this human versus machine thing, it, it needs to be both, right? It needs to be human and machine incorporated. And, you know, in that Xavier story, one of the other things I caught in my reread was there's this fear, this palpable fear of, quote, being along for the ride, being in a torrent of things being done to us, uh, yeah. that, 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 that the past mandates a mucky present or worse, an exponentially mucky future. Um, this the dollar board to your point that exogenous currents right are forcing our hands and stealing our autonomy um if you stick with black boxes and 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 reckless you know um reactivity yeah i, I think you'll get some of that but but i think if you get transparency in the algos and maybe a little more mindfulness about knock on effects we'll have a better go and and the one thing that in the in the last message in the savior story, I think it's really important to appreciate that that narrative that suggests that he actually ended up being the only one person left. So so um, the cost cutting has gone, I think, through the skin and the fat and cut into the muscle all the way into the bone in that in that scenario, right? Yeah. So yes, you are a human enabled by machine, but there probably is um, a limit to how how skinny this can get right right well said well said brother well team one dyad Very good. Down. yeah yeah tremendous one one dyad down two to go dyad is a uh, geek speak for pair of stories <laughs> so we're going to turn this corner um though i think delabor can you see the chat I, or the Q and A, I should say. I just yep. want to make sure that uh, it, anything worth addressing at the moment, or should we defer until um, our yep. big Q and A? I, I'm back. I think we we, we defer to, to to address the okay. questions later. Yeah. Super duper. Okay, great. So, without further ado, let's turn the corner towards education and hear about the allure or the upside with Imani. Add eggs and vanilla extract and whip till smooth. Next, sprinkle brown sugar on top, but do not go overboard. Yes, I'm talking to you, Imani. Imani giggles to herself as she pauses the audio of her mother's famous cookie recipe. Back in her freshman year at Bergen College, she'd learned how to use AI to mimic her mom's voice using just a short audio clip and a block of text. She played this recipe whenever she baked which she often did when she procrastinated. But despite her mom's warning, Imani applies a heaping of brown sugar and pops her mixture into the oven. Back at her desk, Imani resumes the final learning module for her senior year capstone in applied AI. Professor Morris's modules are practically a lullaby and her ADHD doesn't make matters any easier. Fortunately, Imani can feed the module into an AI assistant and watch an avatar of her personal hero, Admiral Grace Hopper, deliver the lecture as a conversation, which better fits her learning style. Once she finishes the module, Imani's feeling quite accomplished, ticking off completed tasks on her holographic tablet. But her smile fades when she realizes she's forgotten the literature review due tonight. She orders an AI research tool to scrape together publicly available papers and synthesize the first draft of a summary, which she reads, edits, and formats within the hour. Then she turns her attention back to the capstone. Before she dictates any code requirements to her tablet, Imani plays the audio of her last visit to office hours. Professor Morris had an interesting remark about her project idea. 
generative AI outputs are everywhere. It's it's like the TikTok of your age. What is TikTok? Imani didn't know what to make of the outdated reference. Never mind. Think outside the box. What's a specific problem that we haven't addressed with generative AI yet? Something only you can tackle. Imani appreciated that she had to go above and beyond what was expected of her. Her ADHD meant people often didn't believe in her capabilities, and she reveled in proving them wrong. She just needed the right idea. The oven chimes. The cookies are done, and the idea strikes Imani. She has fond memories of baking with mom, but their family restaurant was struggling lately to compete against bigger establishments. What if she could develop a generative AI program tailored to small restaurants? It could fuse existing recipes with global cuisines to come up with innovative weekly specials, produce a new website with a few clicks, and even build a basic app for ordering. She would be a hit with all the companies attending AI Recruiting Week. Imani jumps up to grab the cookies and calls her mom. Baking again? The knowing voice on the other line asks. Imani responds with pride filling her chest. A lot more than cookies this time. That was the allure. And now for the concern, we meet a student going to the very same college and dealing with very different circumstances. A text comes in from mom. Osio Ilu, can you pick up your brothers from practice tonight? I have a double shift. Sounds good, types Ilu, who uses the pronoun they and directs an AI assistant to update their calendar with enough time to ride the seven train to Queens. Hmm, this is less time than I thought for that assignment. Elu mutters while singing into a library seat. It's the first full week of classes at Bergen College, and Elu's already eager to score an A in Avatar Generation 101. They'll need it to major in metaverse design. Yet, between their part-time job and helping raise their siblings, there doesn't seem to be enough time in the day. They wish they could just play games in VR, but instead they open up the avatar generation platform and smile at the professor's assignment. Create a group of avatars that reflect your family. You lose sure it'll be a breeze. As a first generation college student, Ilu hears their mother's voice in their head all the time. Be proud of your heritage, Ilu, and never give up. She'd repeated it like a mantra when Ilu complained about the college application process, especially how other students could use AI to generate essays, but the AI never portrayed Cherokee culture or two-spirit people accurately. To satisfy mom, Ilu enters prompts about Cherokee people into the AI, following the professor's guidelines on workarounds, since Cherokee doesn't seem to be a default option. Their eyes widen with disbelief as inaccurate and offensive avatars are generated. Their heart rate quickens. They wipe the sweat from their palms and text a classmate for advice. A text comes in from Ethan. Yeah, I finished the homework. A few of us from my high school shared prompts. Want me to send them to you? Elu rubs their forehead, weighing the options. The idea of sharing prompts seems wrong. And Ethan and his classmates are white, so their prompts might not even generate Cherokee features. Ilu wants to be accurate, but also needs an A. Feeling lost, they shove their laptop in their bag and hustle out of the library to catch Professor Pardo's office hours. The professor scrolls through his holographic tablet, looking distracted as he addresses Ilu. Look, in the past, I haven't seen offensive content generated if prompts are written well, Elu pleads. Professor, I tried all the workarounds. Do you have any other suggestions? I don't know. Maybe focus on ways to represent your family without race, like abstract versions or symbols. Try thinking outside the box. Elu storms out, fuming, while Professor Pardo barely notices their exit. Walking aimlessly towards the library, Ilu sighs as their smartwatch pings with a reminder to pick up their siblings. They turn toward the nearest subway stop as doubts creep into their mind. 
maybe becoming a first generation metaverse designer. The first Cherokee designer they knew was too much to dream. If their classmates are going to have such an easy time in comparison, it, it feels useless to even try competing. As the seven train rattles towards Queens, Elu hangs tight to the pole and rehearses how they'll break the news to mom. The, um, that's a hard one to hear. I, I, my, my, again, we're going to have our three prepared takeaways having been quite familiar with these stories, but hearing you perform it team, um, here's what jumps out to me on this one. Um, there's this old line in tech, us geeks use this line, garbage in, garbage out. Yep. And, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a database thing typically. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I, I've been thinking about generative AI is this, this notion of garbage in garbage squared mm -hmm. under representation is problematic. Generative AI whipping up a dropdown box that doesn't have Cherokees or two spirits. Like that's problematic squared. It, it's like, well, I, I'm not in there. It's it, 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 it it literally turns it um, uh, kind of black or white, one or zero. Uh, the, the 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 digital definition of binary, and and so um, to to me that 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 this risk of um, shades of gray being neatly binned and bifurcated, um, it it just really speaks to me both as a person and a technologist. On the flip side, I'm all for. Um, the collective recipe experience of humanity jamming with. <laughs> Jamming with our allure stories protagonist in, in, in getting down to a quickly rendered uh, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, but but Elu really stuck with me. H how about you, Dalibor? Yeah. So this, clearly, this was such an amplified sort of bias um, concern story, uh, which, which sadly, I think we can all see actually happen. And on that front, we, we got a, actually a very interesting comment uh, from, from one of our audience members it says that the common theme in, in those stories, that Gen AI has the ability to both alleviate, but also accelerate loneliness and grief, right? Hmm. So hmm. the question, and maybe it's a question for us to discuss a little bit is what, what, is, it, you, what is our perspective or this group's perspective on how grief and AI will coexist? Will AI provide closure? Or will it actually be keeping the grief alive? Or, or both? Any sort of reactions to that perspective? Abhijith, I'd, I'd welcome your frame. Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. I, I, think, I think it's another case of you, you can you know, you can apply that idea of grief to both a positive and a negative future, right? In a in a positive future, um, you know, my, my grandma passed away in 2017. There's a positive future where, you know, generative AI would allow me to like interact with, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, amalgamation of her old photos and videos to create like a, you know, a small little memory reel that would, you know, make it feel like, you know, this sort of similar feeling to, oh, I, you know, I dreamt about my grandma yesterday. I think to the extent that we do that with guardrails, that we, you know, limit things like uh, the, the time that we put into those things and the, uh, the time that we can consume the sort of like, you know, artificially generated things, I, I, I think it can, it, can, it can serve a purpose for people to process things. There's a negative future where, you know, it's all the sci-fi movies that have come out about, you know, our, us becoming too dependent on chatbots, falling in love with chatbots, you know, processing emotions and things through computers um, instead of being able to sort of reckon with the, the realities of them as, as humans and, and, and amongst other humans. And I think it, uh, you know, some, somewhere in between is like the, again, the, the right path to figure out how, uh, how emotional AI uh, assists us. But Mike, I, I know you have 
um, some great thoughts on just the future of how AI is going to progress in those you know, emotional or soft skills directions. No, I mean, I, the, when we talk about, so there's this quote that those, those who've um, put up with me in, in the past have heard me say, Larry Tesler from Xerox, he, he used to say that AI is whatever computers can't do yet. And I like to marry that up with this, this recognition that um, those of us who have kids or have ever been kids, um, we know there's different flavors of intelligence, right? The, some, some of our kids are really good at, at, at arithmetic and, and then others, not so much, but they're gifted writers, right? Or, or, or dancers, performers, empaths. Um, just as there's different kinds of smart with our kids, I think what we're seeing to your point, Abhijith and, and Dalibor, there needs to be different kinds of smart for mechanical minds. And, and, and so this idea of um, what does it mean to detect and emulate emotion? Uh, it better be good enough to not cause drama and trauma. <laughs> I didn't mean to rhyme them, but they both. Uh, but but then, yeah, to, to your follow-on point, Abhijith, um, I don't think this stuff can be a proxy or, or, or a replacement for uh, real human connection. Um, I, I think it can be a helper, but it can't be the whole answer. So um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, team, we are heading into the home stretch, the back third. Now with a focus on our final pair, this time around society. So first we're going to hear the allure, right? The upside story, the, the what might go right story, starting with our protagonist, Raphael. Do you want to build a snowman? Come on, let's go and play. Candace belts out the lines as her mother Maria stops the car outside the home design store. Poppy, I think I should be a singer when I grow up. Her father, Raphael, smiles at Candace, hoping to keep her in good spirits despite this sudden shopping trip on her birthday. Of course, yeah. Cairo has great choirs. Maybe our new home can have a piano. Yesterday, Raphael received an unexpected promotion to senior engineer, requiring him and his family to relocate to Egypt within the year. Since graduating with his PhD in nuclear engineering, he dreamed of commercializing fusion-produced power, and this opportunity would be a huge step forward. Still, he couldn't shake his nerves about nine-year-old Candace adjusting to a new country. He hoped that visualizing it could get her excited. At the store, Raphael speaks to a design consultant who turns his preferences into prompts for their generative AI. Donning VR headsets in an immersive media room, Raphael and his family visualize different neighborhoods in Cairo and then enter the home generated by their prompt. Mid-century modern style with two floors, home office, and a kid's room with a piano. Raphael immediately takes an interest in the kitchen and asks the AI to place the stove in a different area and generate the smell of his favorite meal, his grandmother's ajiaco recipe, to really feel at home. Meanwhile, Maria smells the soup as she speeds upstairs to work on her perfect home office, prompting the AI with requests about window placement, monitor screens, and a whiteboard. Candace, too, hesitantly heads up the stairs to her room. Knowing she's a child, the AI begins with providing options for fun wall colors, and Candace settles on a periwinkle blue. The design consultant taps her on the shoulder and asks if she'd like any murals on her wall. Hmm, I want to put Elsa in Egypt. Candace thinks out loud, and instantly a mural is generated of the Disney princess in Pharaoh's clothes. Raphael's nerves are calmed by the sound of Candace's delight. After a long evening at the store, the family gets home and gathers around their smart coffee table with a cupcake for Candace's birthday. Raphael asks, Hey, do you want Elsa to sing you happy birthday? Hmm, I think I want her to sing about the pyramids instead. Raphael chuckles. <laughs> Let me see if she can work the pyramids into the happy birthday song. As he pulls up the screen on the coffee table, the first image is his tailored daily newsletter. He gasps, 
at an image of his college roommate, Tyler, in a headline about plagiarism. He, he shoots a glance at Maria and swipes away, opening the Disney application. Since he's purchased a license, Raphael can prompt the character to generate any child-friendly song with just a few taps. He nudges Candace. Okay, you ready to sing? And now we move into the concern. Where we're meeting Raphael's friend, Tyler. Something is missing. Tyler mutters to himself as he stares at the website he's designed for his client's new salon. He quickly uploads his initial draft to his favorite AI design platform and uses prompts that he's mastered to produce alternate designs. He picks the option that best represents his style, sharp angles and gradients that produce a shimmering yet minimalist look. He sends the design mock-up over to his client and leans back, feeling satisfied. Thanks to his work going viral on a popular design blog, Tyler had turned his beloved design hobby into a full-time job, and the speed of generative AI enabled him to take on hundreds of small clients in the past few years. Suddenly remembering the date, Tyler clicks over to the page of a design competition he had entered, one that could land him a huge contract. The page says, check back at 11 a.m. on the 15th of June to see if your design has been chosen to represent everyone's favorite burger joint. Tyler sighs as he glances at the clock. 10.58 a.m., almost there. He feels optimistic. He'd impressed the fast food company's executives by prompting his AI platform to add his distinct style to their iconic brand. The page begins to refresh, and Tyler clenches his fist with excitement. A familiar design spreads across the screen, and a smile spreads across Tyler's cheeks. He scrolls down the page to screenshot the prize announcement so he can send it to his good friend, Raphael. But his joy quickly fades as he reads, congratulations to our winners, PS Design. Tyler scrambles to call his contact, Kim, who organized the brand competition. When she picks up, he frantically explains that there must be a mistake. The design on the page is unmistakably his, but Kim's response is cold. Well, we went with PS Design because of their size and reputation. They use the same AI model you prefer, so maybe or perhaps it drew on your work? If not that, it's so hard to approve malintent anyways. In either case, I'm sorry, I'm afraid our decision is final. Before Tyler can reply, she hangs up, leaving him fuming. He paces around his office, considering his options, but eventually returns to his laptop and comes across an article about the government not passing AI legislation due to lobbyists. A few commenters claim that they've run an information check and found that the story was fabricated using AI, but others echo the article sentiments and post more examples. Tyler feels his heart pounding as he scrolls through pages and pages about independent artists being plagiarized with no recourse until he finds a forum that encourages creators to fight back. Using reams of historical evidence that seem convincing, the forum users present an argument that captivates Tyler. He follows the steps they suggest to generate a deep fake video of PS Design CEO admitting to financial fraud and posts it anonymously on his favorite design blog. He shuts his laptop and rushes away, feeling unsure. The next morning, Tyler wakes up and can't stop regretting his decision. He hopes to quietly delete the deep fake, but his jaw drops when he sees that it's received millions of views and several hundred comments. Knowing this isn't right, Tyler reveals himself as the original poster. Messages from reporters start flooding his inbox, and Tyler sighs as he looks at the clock again. It's about to be an even longer day than yesterday. Be like Tyler and Xavier need to see the same therapist. Oh. <laughs> the um, you know what's interesting here? This is a meta observation because part of part of trying to do different kind of work and 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 taking risks is you 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 don't know until you do it. And something that I find here, Dalibor, is that the recency effect can be in full effect. I that. The Tyler story, the concern story is freshest in my mind. And so I think, yikes, look at everything that could go wrong. 
And so I'm going to re resist that temptation and, and really lean into Raphael and say, man, um, this idea, picking up on our last discussion, th this idea of getting his Disney princess decked out like a pharaoh and into a pyramid happy birthday song as a means of managing the stress of moving, that feels like technology done right right? That feels not like emotional sabotage. That feels like emotional supports. And as a parent, I'll take it, right? Right. Yep. I, I saw this great quote on Insta just the other day. It's like, I gave my kid a popsicle at 7 a.m. because I chose happiness. <laughs> Delivore, what, what was your take from these two? The, uh, the Both stories were beautiful. I actually really liked Tyler's story because I think it, it showcases something that many of us who are in the business of creating things can actually, could and should be worried about, right? So, so I think that this, the, the Tyler story is actually very, 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 very real. The question becomes then, what should, what should we as a society do to prevent this potentially very likely and very, real scenario playing itself out, especially with the ability to do the deep face of people's voices and faces and images. And, and like, this, I think, is a very, very important one. And I think that this one actually is a great, great story to tell as you are describing the rationale for why governments here absolutely need to have a role to play in making sure that... Uh, that 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 you know controls are in place that scenarios like this do not actually do not happen i mean abijith and, and dalibor both I, I i have a friend um who shall re remain nameless for for this audience but but uh he had a he had written a detailed book on an arcane technical topic mm -hmm. and and published it on a, a Re online retailer we're all well aware of and within 12 hours found that there was a competitive book that was in his language close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades which i thought was a vivid description but aka like it was fine derivative but fine um with the same title and yeah and he ended up being featured in a in a, a large newspaper about it, it, the headline was something akin to a, a generative AI uh, copied my book in less than a day. Wow. Yeah. And and that's all to say, it doesn't mean this stuff is bad and we shouldn't do it, right? Because I think part of the nature of dichotomies here is saying no, 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 no. Give me the give me the shortcut from ideation to execution. Yeah. Right. Help me work at the speed of imagination. Help me build that restaurant with the best of my grandma's recipes and the best of the internet corpus's wisdom. Yeah. Um, but let's do it in a way that respects the creators all the way upstream. I mean, when 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 deceased uh, crooners are singing deceased rappers' tunes online, it's worth a chuckle. But how do you remunerate and respect the estates and the artists? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. There was an interesting comment from one of our audience members that says the recent article on Vox.com discussed that government and voters should be able to decide whether they want artificial general intelligence to be developed or not, not just how it should be regulated, which is an interesting perspective. I would love to get your thoughts on, on, on that topic. Uh, but like, I, I think that Genie is out of the bottle. And there is no putting Genie back into the bottle. And if we decide to regulate here, the development will continue elsewhere. Yeah. This is not, this is, we are in a, we have unleashed, um, we have un yeah. unleashed this, right? But I would love to get your perspectives on that too. And, and maybe perspectives on, 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 on the role that government should play or could play. But You know, the, <laughs> the the image that comes to mind, I, I live and die by tortured analogies, is whack-a-mole. That, that's the carnival game for those who, who don't share my Midwestern U.S. sensibility where like you hit the thing and then the thing pops up over here. I don't 
know that this can be truly suppressed insofar as to your point, Dalibor, um, if it what's illegal in Illinois, I, I say this as an Illinoisan, what, what, what's illegal in Illinois has a way of becoming super legal in Indiana and vice versa. <laughs> and so um, I agree the genie's out of the bottle, but I do think it may, maybe a historical analog is I think there will be conscious societies or groups or clusters who through the democratic process elect to, to go slightly different routes, right? Um, a weak analogy, but it pops into my head, you know, um, the Amish or the Mennonites saying, no, 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 we don't reject technology. We reject certain kinds of technology, right? I could see that, but, but generally speaking, and Abhijit, I, I'd love your take on this too. I, I do think that we're in such a mode right now of critique on, on the, these novelties that we're going to start to see inarguably creative and positive use cases and already are where, 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 yeah, the, the amplification of human potential done mindfully is, is going to make it such that this genie is largely out of the bottle. Uh, uh, Abhijit or team, Angela, Nathan, well, welcome your thoughts as we turn the corner towards our conclusory statements. Yeah, absolutely. I think the genie is out of the bottle. I think uh, any, you know, attempt to, uh, you know, tamp this down is just going to, yeah, whack a mole. It's just going to pop up somewhere else. And so the, I, I think the, the smarter thing to do, and, you know, the U S at least has recently been doing this work of, you know, meeting, uh, in the halls of Congress about it. Regulation is, is, is necessary. Even the, all the big tech players think that it's necessary. Of course, they have their own incentives about how it's going to happen, et cetera. But, uh, the, the question of whether or not there needs to be some sort of guardrails, I think everybody agrees that there should be, we know that it can veer into very negative territory without it. And I think that, uh, you know, thankfully we have existing laws and rules around copyright, around, you know, licensing things that apply here. We just have to be smart about how we take those and, and use it for this new technology that's sort of yeah. um, breaking the ways that we think about copyright and, and all yeah. of those things, right? It's um, one of the things that I would uh, say uh, just, just to finish is, uh, we're really conscious on this team of dichotomies about walking the walk. I'm not just talking the talk. So we we use generative AI to come up with the uh, all the characters that you saw today, all of the images of the personas. Oh. Um, we didn't do it, you know, haphazardly. We we asked our designer on the team, our human designer, to say, you know, how can you think of a way to use generative AI to augment your work, um, and then you know figure out you know how how you're gonna you know apply your own expertise and genius on what generative AI produces, whether that's through prompting or whether through it's your own editing as a designer. Um, and so that, that was really important to us. And for the, for similar reasons, we didn't use it for the act, the text of the stories, because we wanted that to come from our own creativity, our own, our own passion behind what we thought the stories could be. And so there's going to be use cases where we figure out what's, what is useful for and not. And I think that's an important um, step to take. And Man, I'm over here wondering how Im how you found a picture of Imani baking cupcakes, and now now I know. So. Now we know. Now we know. <laughs> and I think what is also interesting, and and of course we are we are uh, we, we we brought this particular webcast session as a collection of stories. I think it is really important um, for everyone to appreciate the actual power of effective storytelling, and that's. Like th these are all these are all very specific, concrete use cases, good or bad. But I think that presenting them as part of a story, um, I think, yeah. brings in the emotion that makes this, I think, m much more real, right? Dalibor, I, I, um, the, the, the your 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 thoughtful remark doubles as an uncanny segue to this sort of heavily serifed belief that, as you said, sir, and, and uh, Abhijit, Angela, Nathan, as you've demonstrated, we could have spent 45 minutes with a laundry list of generative AI use cases. Um, yep. That would have been problematic for two reasons. One is you've probably all had three of those already this week. <laughs> if your week's <laughs> anything like mine. But, but two, you don't feel it. The, the future of technology is the future of 
the people who are going to be using that technology. And exactly. And and fiction, the the reason the reason we put this in big, you know, 72 point font. Futures work is necessarily lacking in case studies and quantitative data points. Right? Take it from a futurist. I've looked. <laughs> I don't have I don't have sums and averages for 2039. Yeah, projections. Yeah. yeah. And so our our provocation, our 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 belief is that these stories allow us to come as close as we can to really empathizing with the gory, nuanced details of the decisions that we're about to make together. Right? Genie's out of the bottle. How are we going to work with the genie? Right. Frankly, no, no sales zone, no shill mojo, but th that's, that's us, right? That mm -hmm. Deloitte looking at tech as a tool, but trust as the point. Yeah. And, and so, you know, with what, that what did, we're, I'd, yeah, I'd love so, your, your thoughts. And, yeah. I think it is really important to, to think exactly in the way you described um, we have the responsibility, we have the accountability, and we now have the power to make choices that are going to lead us towards a happier future as opposed to these dystopian stories we've heard. But what is very real for me is that in all of these stories, I recognized technology that is just around the corner. So this is not far-fetched. This is near-fetched. And I think that we can expect to be truly in this reality um, in the next in the next few years this is this was excellent this was very new very i think very very actually innovative way to describe this so thank you very much team for for putting together this this set of stories um, this is one dichotomy conversation that we are going to have we will have two more dichotomy conversations coming down the pike next time we meet for our dichotomies, we are going to talk about biotech. And so November 1st, Wednesday, a little bit more than a month away from now, uh, we will reconvene on this channel with Mike Abijith and the team to talk about biotech in the same context. Positive stories, negative stories, utopian future, dystopian threats. So, ladies and gentlemen, please plan to join us back November 1st. Of course, everyone who registered will get an email from me. We have recorded this session, so we're going to also send you the link to this recording. And then please join us for our dichotomy number two on biotech November 1st. With that, Mike, back to you to close us off. Abhijit, Angela, Nathan, thank you so very much on behalf of me and our audience, and of course, on behalf of Deloitte. I, I, what Dalibor said, Angela, thank you. <laughs> Nathan, thank you. Abhijit, thank you. And um, team, welcome back to Enterprise Storytime, November 1st. We'll see you there. All the best. Have yourselves a lovely Wednesday and bye-bye.